I'm Brady Bacon, and this is The Skinny. From the Fatheads Eyewear Studios in Speedway, Indiana, this is The Skinny. Brought to you by Toyota, Rhino Classifieds, General Tire, and Dream Giveaway. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by General Tire. It's more than just a slogan. Anywhere is possible with General Tire. General Tire's Grabber X3 Mud Terrain Tire offers aggressive styling and is engineered for durability with innovative performance features that are ready to carry you through extreme mud, dirt, and rock-covered terrain. For extreme traction that's ready for anything and rugged styling to match, look no further than the Grabber X3. Make your anywhere possible by visiting GeneralTire.com today. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to The Skinny here once again. We've got an exciting show coming your way. The Macho Man is in the house. We are talking about sprint car greatness and sitting alongside a brand new face to the show, but by far not a brand new face, nor a brand new face (laughs) in the broadcasting industry. Michael Young, they call him the track dude. Been around for a long, long time as a broadcaster, my friend. Welcome to the show. It's exciting to be here. Going to be a lot of fun filling in for Rico this uh, this uh, show and uh, looking forward to uh, talking with Brady. Uh, and it's just exciting to have him here with us today. It's going to be a lot of fun. Well, and uh, and let's expand on that a little bit. You're actually a full-timer here now. You're going to be a big part of this show. Maybe not always on, although you're always welcome on, of course. But behind the scenes as um, producer, editor, you and Carl will be working your magic together. So we, we look forward to uh, your insights, if you will. Looking forward to being a part of this great program at, uh, and hopefully having a, a long stint with you guys. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, we're looking forward to it for sure. And uh, we'll kick things off this weekend. Actually, we've got a nice big event coming up called The Rev at uh, at the Speedway, which you'll be an important part of, of course, and your relationships with the IndyCar drivers. We're certainly excited about that. Yeah, it's a, it's been a long haul with the IndyCar folks, and it's my first rev, so looking forward to that. I actually have to go out and buy some nice clothes because <laughs> I, I don't own any good clothing. I'm with so. you, too. You want yeah. to go to Walmart together? Well, I mean, Yes, that's a great <laughs> – let's go to Walmart and get a suit. That's a wonderful plan. Wonderful I mean, a plan. moment ago you said you had no pants on, so uh, let's it, at least get a shirt. Okay, you know? fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Maybe a, a tie as well, okay. Sitting alongside me is uh, a third generation, Brady Bacon, uh, three-time USAC sprint car champ. He is a badass no matter what he's behind the wheel of. They call him the Macho Man. Uh, but I want to kick things off. And I don't, Carl, do you have that picture that I sent you? Sure I want to ask you, like, uh, tell me about this. Are we working on some fourth-generation racers? Yeah, we uh, kind of started asking about go-karts and stuff. Uh, so I... Uh, I got on Facebook Marketplace and, and found one, the, the yellow one I was going to go buy, and then he just so happened to have the blue one sitting there, too, so I wound up taking them both home at the same time. So three children, uh, Levaney, is that? Levany. Levany, Levany, Lowry, and Lindley. Correct. Two girls and a boy. Yeah. And, uh, and we're going racing. Uh, we're just playing right now, so <laughs> I'll, I'm going to try to delay the actual racing as long as I can. So, so what are the ages? Six, four, and two. You started when you were, what, five? Yeah. So we're right in the wheelhouse here. Yeah, but for those first few years, a lot of headaches for dad. So <laughs> they don't, I didn't really feel like, you know, they don't really, really start getting it until maybe like seven or eight. So, uh, obviously a lot of make a lot of friends i'm still got some of my best friends or people that i raced with when i was five six seven years old but uh we're around we got a you know racing community of our own at all the usac races and they have a lot of friends there and stuff too so we got the that part covered but yeah try to delay the racing part as long as i can he he says he i don't i don't want to race i'm i don't want to get hurt i'm like well what this go kart's the same thing. He's like, yeah, but I have a helmet on. I'm like, well, you're gonna have a helmet on when you <laughs> race too. Right. <laughs> Do you remember the first time that you got into a cart? Your does that memory stick out to you? Uh, no, it, I remember kind of making some laps in parking lots and stuff like that. Um, but uh, did I, you did you have the bug right away? Was it something that you said, man, I love this? Yeah, I mean, my dad raced. We go to the races all the time, and just kind of natural thing to do um we used to that was our weekends i'd race. i think friday night we would race uh you know micros and then my dad would race saturday night at tulsa speedway and then sunday when i was still racing quarter midgets we'd go and race quarter midgets on sunday so that was pretty much what filled our weekends uh 
for my whole life. So you've been down the path. I'm really curious what your thoughts are here. When you start somebody off at, at the age of five, I, I think the potential for burnout with that person goes way, way up. You know, by the time they get into their teens, maybe they're just smoked with it versus starting maybe when they're 10 or 12. And I didn't do it by design. It just worked out this way. But I was around racing the entire time. So my son inherently was around racing. But I never thought about putting him in a car, maybe just because I couldn't afford it at the time. But um, but at some point, he decided he wanted to a go-kart. We went to He wanted to go in a go-kart shop. So we went in there and he saw it, fell in love with it, wanted to go go-kart racing. And Ended up buying one, and and the rest is history here, you know, near 20 years later. But he was 13 years old at the time, and he was hungry. He wanted to go racing versus, you know, somebody starting off so young. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I was five years old, I was more worried about getting to my grandma's car and sitting in the air conditioning. You know, they'd have to come find me to, you know, get in the car, which obviously I enjoyed racing, but uh, there was a couple times growing up where my dad was like, yeah, if this is as this is all you got, we're probably going to do something else for a while and kind of took steps back and tried, you know, going to the lake. And then I decided, okay, that was fun, but I would rather be racing. And then that's kind of when the switch. Yeah. Gets clearly flipped. worked out for you, but your mindset, obviously you're, you're an exceptional uh, driver and you're drawn to it. I just think generally speaking, <clears throat> It's, it's a crapshoot to start a kid off at five, six, seven years old and thinking they're going to run all the way through. Oh, I'm going to give him a good early head start, get him the best equipment. He'll have the most experience by the time he's 15 years old. He'll have 10 years of experience to be ready to race with anybody. But somewhere in the middle of that, the kid's like, I'm just over it, man. I just want a weekend off, you know? Yeah, and a lot of like professional drivers, they, don't, they can't race with their kids when they're younger, so they do wind up. I mean, Sheldon didn't start. I think he just raced a sprint car. He, I mean, he raced motorcycles and things like that. Sheldon Hoddenshield when he was growing up. But I think the first car he raced was a sprint car. Um, and he turned out pretty yeah, good. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, some others, the McCarls, uh, I remember they didn't start racing until like micros when they were, you know, probably 13, 14 years old. So um, you have a lot of advantages having, you know, we're obviously in the industry. So we have, we'll have a lot, probably a lot of advantages if he does race because we, kind of up on what's fast For sure. and, oh, and what's mean, not. So that's probably more important. Sometimes kids starting out young, the, the dads are learning what oh, they're, they're supposed clueless. to do as much as, they're clueless. you know, as Hello? anybody Hello? else. Yeah. <laughs> I was clueless. Yeah. I mean, I knew Here's people. my wallet. Here, take that. Yeah, I mean, I knew people, which really helped me out, but I was exactly like you. I was thinking about, I mean, a really good friend of ours, and his son actually was really good, but his dad was an accountant, knew nothing about racing, and they just came to the racetrack together to run carts at, at Newcastle, and he ripped. I mean, he did a good job, but how many of those parents just never get, you know, some people just aren't mechanically inclined, you know. How do they ever get there, you know? Yeah, and I mean, now it's kind of, the landscape's changing. You can pay, you know, people to take care of your stuff and, um, you know, kind of just show up and race, but that just costs more money and makes it a little harder for the guy trying to do it himself but i was fortunate my dad's uh you know he built one of my quarter midgets from scratch so um a lot of you know we had a lot of advantage as far as him knowing what to do to make stuff go fast but that's a blueprint now to get the kids in the cars as early as they can you were in the car at five but looking back on it and looking at how you're going to deal with your kids in racing is that a good thing bad thing to you to have somebody start out that early as as Ed ken had, had said it is it a good thing, bad thing? Because that looks like the norm anymore. Yeah, I just think it de depends on your situation. If the kid's loving it, we have some uh, friends from Winchester that race at Newcastle. I think he's six years old, and he loves it. You know, if they're motivated and they want to do it, then that's, you know, you got to kind of just facilitate what they want to do. But if it can turn into, like, you know, baseball dads, you're on the traveling team and you're going everywhere and the kid's like, hey, I kind of want to go to my friend's birthday party this weekend instead of go race yeah. in Tennessee or whatever. So I think it just depends on the situation. I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to try to push it back as far as I can. But I think, you know, around eight, nine years old is kind of when you, the competitiveness they kind of figure out what's actually going on and how to win and not just, oh, I won or I didn't. They start figuring out why I won or why I didn't or, you know, what can we do better or worse to, to change the results. 
So it is that young, eight or nine. Like I said, I mean, my only experience is starting off with my son, and he was like he was like thirteen. I was surprised. It took about a year, I would say, a year and a half. Um, I, I, but I and I remember, you know, we we were around Connor Daly and and Derek, and I would listen to Derek and the questions. I, I would bounce stuff off of Derek, and he would say, "I ask the same the same questions every single time he gets out of the car," and uh, and and I want him to process that. He said, and and they can't grasp the entire track when they're this young. He said, so I have them focus. I have him focus on one turn. Tell me what the car is doing, entry, middle, and, and exit, you know, in this turn. And he said, I, and I just want him to retain that because it's so difficult to do. So I started doing, I just started following that, that protocol. But I remember when the light bulb went off, I mean, it, it happened so quickly that I didn't even trust him. I didn't believe the information he was giving me, like he would say, you know, the back's driving the front. And I'd be like, what? You really feel that? Or he said, you know, he would say it's lifting up the, the inside tire, but it's setting it back down too quick. Uh, and it, I mean, and it happened, I'm telling you, it happened in a span of weeks where all of a sudden it just made sense to him. And it happened so fast. I was like, there's just no way he knows all this stuff that's going on. It's like, he's just saying this to be cool, you know, and act like he knows. But I mean, he knew it just, it just happened. So it was pretty cool to watch them learn and go through that process. Yeah, and that your kind of race IQ varies. You know, there's people that race like they're 30 when they're 14, and there's people that are 30 that race like they're 14. <laughs> so um, it's just it just like anything else. Some people are good at math. Some people are, you know, some people are good at racing, and they just get it. Uh, you know, Kyle Larson was oh 14 and just could race. and. Yeah. Um, it's not just going around the track fast. It's looking ahead, seeing what's going to happen and, um, knowing what you can do to, to change stuff. And, you know, when, and like the lower powered cars, we only have two turns to worry about. So, you know, uh, it's a little easier than the road course stuff, but, um, when they're in lower powered cars, they just hold it wide open and go around in circles. So, uh, if he decides he kind of wants to start earlier than I would like, I think I would kind of lean towards the road course stuff because at least they have to slow down sometimes, you know, uh, you know, when you're just holding it wide open, like even like junior sprints uh, on like dirt ovals is kind of the introductory class for like the micro division. The tracks are made for more powerful cars. So they, it's kind of like Daytona, you know, they do learn about momentum and how to not scrub speed. And, but then when they get to the car that they have to lift in, I think it takes them a while to adjust so there's a lot of ways to do it and uh, every kid's different and you see some kids get it right away and even people in sprint cars and stuff guys like you know cj leary he, it took him several years to turn into a contender every night and now he's you know one of the you know five guys that you have to deal with every single night so some people it's right away some people it takes them a while some people are better in different cars some people aren't very good in a midget good in a sprint car so just, no right or wrong. It just I, comes together, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, what I think is interesting about you is your education was so important and you were the valedictorian of your class that sometimes those things don't go hand in hand, that drivers are also worried about their education and completing their education. Same with your kids. I would imagine that that I would imagine what you would pass down to them that school is very important. Yeah, definitely. Uh, kindergarten this was our first year with school and missing school racing and stuff uh you know this is what we do for a living so we've had to kind of navigate that and change our schedule a little bit uh, luckily the USAC schedule caters to we're a little closer to home than maybe the outlaws or all-stars or stuff like that so we're still trying to just navigate that and uh you know Leveny doesn't really have any interest in racing but she likes to you know dance class and this was our first mini 4-H, and she's all about that. So it took a lot of uh, strength to not come home with an animal after uh, a week. But we were out there for three, four, five hours every day. They wanted to go out and just run around, and which is great. You know, it's better than sitting at home. I, I grew up in Clearwater, Florida, and I was just never around any of the 4-H stuff. And, of course, you move here to the Midwest, and it's like, oh, my God. You know, it's like everybody's entire world. And when they have those conventions and stuff here in Indy, I mean, it just blows up. It's, it's millions of people is what it feels like anyways. But um, I, I, I find it funny that I was so secluded from the whole thing. And I think, you know, you get people probably in New York or people on, on the West Coast, they just don't get it. 
get how big that 4-H thing is. But it, yeah, if she wants to do that, that that can suck up some time. Yeah, it's like the whole community's there, you know. So it's it's really cool, and they have friends. There, she's more interested in, you know, it's about friends and running around, sure. yeah, which is important. Sure, more than the actual, you know, they don't actually judge the mini stuff, but they get to. They kind of walk them through the process. This is kind of how you would show this rabbit. Well, luckily, we got to borrow one. We didn't actually have to bring <laughs> one. But, uh, yeah, and she showed a, a, a pig, and uh, eight, the Abrus were really into... Oh, really? Uh, oh, it's huge. He's got a, like, state-of-the-art... Winery uh, and pigs. Yeah. No Swine kidding. and wine. <laughs> Swine and wine. Yeah. That's but, great. Uh, I sent a picture to Rico, and he goes, don't send that to my dad. He'll have... you." You'll have a barn out there, and he'll have all this <laughs> stuff, and be flying there to the show. The rabbits everywhere. will be making rabbits. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so we have this lovely lady sitting over here. And we're talking about your kids the entire time, as it turns out so far. So, pronounce her name for for us. Sia Siana. So, I mean, it's a good thing. I mean, you know, you're, when you're in school, you always go alphabetically, right? So, but she's screwed either way it goes. First name or last name, they both start with an X. So she's at the end of the line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, her. Uh, CC, just that's the easiest way for everyone to remember. So. I love it. I mean, I just look at the spelling of it; it's so cool. Oh, yeah, she's uh, accustomed to that getting wrong. She actually got a speeding ticket uh, recently, and she couldn't. F- we trying to pay it online. Well, there's a space in her name. Well, they didn't put a space when they entered it in the computer, so we couldn't find the ticket to pay it, and uh, so that was a little bit of a oh boy a problem. We we got it sorted out, I think, but uh, yeah, it's. Uh, so what does mom think about the kids eventually going racing? Uh, I think we're just on, on the same page. Same if they page, want yeah. to do it, 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 it's great. And the kids like going to the races right now. I'm sure there's be times when they don't like it because they would rather be doing something else. But I mean, the mom's way in heavy in, in this subject. A lot of times they might be okay with, you know, just bobbing and weaving and going with the flow. But when it comes to the kids, and, and I think a perfect example would be Rob Klepper, and you get Nikki. You know, Nikki Wilkie, if you will, Nikki Wilkie Klepper, and and she's grown up and and it, you know, at the highest levels, and she's adamant about no way they're not getting in a race car. It's not gonna happen. It's like, are you kidding me? You, I mean, what family do you come from? You know, how how can you say that? Yeah, and she does she did not grow up in a racing family. Um, so but obviously she's been around it for, you know, years and years now. But uh it's a different level of commitment to go racing and obviously it's expensive and it's just a little bit different than some other sports but uh there's you know people that spend tons of money on baseball or basketball going to camps and stuff so it's just kind of what you do the most important part you know i think when they're young is that they enjoy it and they're making friends having experiences and things like that so my kids have i don't know how many states my daughter my oldest daughter has been in she was born in arizona the day after I won a championship. So uh, they've got to experience a lot more than a lot of kids. But uh, to do that, they have to spend a lot of time riding in the motorhome too. Right, right. What's the ultimate goal for you? Are you where you want to be right now? Obviously, you've started the promotion end of things. Growing as a driver, obviously, you've, you've done darn near everything you can do. Where, where do you want to be five years from now? Uh, I mean, I'm pretty happy with where we're at. We've put a really good team of people and sponsors supporters together um you know the business side i've gotten better at in the last through my career you know there's things you take for granted when you're younger and you're just trying to get race to race and as you get older you start you know thinking ahead and the bigger picture and even just six months ahead i need to i know i need to have this equipment coming now to beat the rush and uh, a lot better at taking care of my sponsors probably than I was when I was uh, probably a little more arrogant younger. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm happy with what we're doing. We're just going to try to keep adding, kind of build a legacy, I guess. And um, you, I, every time I try to do something different than non-wing sprint cars, it, I say it's like a rubber band. The, fir- the harder I pull away, the harder it pulls back. It just kind of seems to be what works or you know, it works for Rico. It works for other supporters that we have. And it just, uh, we're just going to try to keep fine tuning what we got and, and making it better and better. And then, uh, yeah, we obviously, I'm trying to think about way down the road doing some promotion stuff here and there uh, to try to kind of figure that out. So when it does come time for me to, to stop racing, we have uh, other options. So what's the toughest part for you? I, I know as 
these young kids come up in racing now, social media, they've, they've become their own promoter. Basically, they promote themselves constantly through the social media outlets. You were kind of in the tail end of the beginning of all of that. Is that one of your forays? Do you find that difficult to be a self-promoter like that and promote the things that you do, not only on track, but off track as well? Yeah, I'm not as good as some. I, I just don't like to be on my phone all the time, putting that stuff out there. Even just like me and her, she likes to take pictures all the time. And I'm like, can we just do it? Yeah. But then a year later, you're like, oh, I'm kind of glad I have that yeah. picture to look at. <laughs> but uh, I'm more of a doer, just do it now. And I don't really, and then, you know, I probably, she's, she makes me, be a lot better and she handles a lot of our promotion stuff and uh social media and she's way better at it than i am and she'll make me do stuff that i should be doing that i don't sometimes but uh it's tough when you're thinking about your car and you know on race day i, I don't do a whole lot just try to focus on what i'm doing but um some people you know their social media is more important than their results and they promote themselves that way and they're they, and they make it and they they build a successful formula that way, that's not really how I do it. I'm more focused on, I'm more a little more old school and work on my car and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, when I started, social media was, well, I think I just got a Facebook. Like, uh, you know, I had already started racing midgets before I even had Facebook, probably. Yeah, I, I, we have a couple of sponsors, and it's mandated now in the contract. We have to do a certain amount. Yeah, of that's of most of, uh, and, and and it is good for the sponsors. I mean, a lot of people see that stuff. I think sometimes if you do too much, it just kind of gets lost as noise. But if you do it right, I think uh, I'd like to think we do a good job of taking care of our sponsors on there and and things like that, and incorporating it into you know everyday life too. You, people like to they don't like to just see the you know here's my fat heads. You know, right. just you can tell it's not organic. Um, so we try to keep people up to date with what we're actually doing. We went to Montana and Wyoming, and my wife posted some great pictures and stuff on, on that. People are interested in the actual life more than the stage stuff sometimes. So got to mix it in. Do you worry about the privacy end of things, especially with the kids? Is that you see a lot of drivers, you see their family, you see him growing up, but Ryan Hunter Ray comes to mind. You see his kids always with him at the racetrack. Is that something you'd like to keep at the um, side? We're, I don't think we're quite to that level where it has become a problem. You know, when you get to NASCAR, then it's, you know, you got people taking pictures all the time. And, um, our kids, <laughs> sometimes they're like, someone will come up, Hey, Lowry, you know, how's it going? And then they'll leave and he goes, uh, how does he know my name? You know, uh, so there's that. But short track dirt racing people are great people in general, and it's a great community. So it hasn't really been a problem till now. And obviously, we keep things to ourselves, and you know, just have our family and friends included on some of the stuff that we have. And um, it's more Ciciana's job to balance that, and I just try not to worry about it. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break here. We have Brady Bacon, the Macho Man, in the house with us on the skinny. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Rhino Classifieds. Tired of all those ads and random stuff that shows up when you're looking to buy or sell your car parts? Rhino Classifieds was created just for you. Welcome to a streamlined buying and selling app created by racers for racers and race fans. Modified cars, classic cars, race cars, that special big block you need. The trailer to move your baby around the country in. We got you at rhino.co. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Toyota. Welcome back to The Skinny. We have Brady Bacon in the house. Michael Young has joined us here in place of Rico. The chair uh, is wondering, like, where's my where's my partner? I hardly feel anybody here. <laughs> We're beat up on Rico a little bit since yeah, he isn't here to defend himself. It's a big chair. It's a very <laughs> large chair. I'm kind of glad Rico's not here. He probably knows some, you know. Dirt on you? More <laughs> dirt than <laughs> we've been together for a long time. So there's he's... We've done some. It gets kind of crazy sometimes when we're uh, not uh, when I'm not racing and we're together. It can get uh, 
Oh, yeah. He likes to put the hammer down. He does like to put the hammer down. Not afraid to do so uh, back to back either. How, how'd you get the name Macho Man? I get that question a lot, and uh, it actually is just kind of a coincidence. I, I grew up, I was a wrestling fan, you know, watching. I used to, like, go to my grandma's house, and she'd take me to the video store, VHS, and uh, <laughs> I'd go and get, like, old wrestling tapes and watch them when I was younger, back when it was good, you know? And Randy Savage, obviously, his promos and stuff. And just one night, I, I, I don't know if you've probably heard of the Frolic at the... Uh, Sprint car races, Indiana Sprint Week, just a group of guys. Everyone kind of hangs out afterwards, and a lot of the drivers go. And for some reason, I was doing a Macho Man impression. And then they, then people would ask me to do it again. And then one of them has a, a Class C with a bunk. And whoever would go to sleep first in there on the couch, I would get up and do an elbow drop on, <laughs> on him. And then uh, some, it was just kind of a joke. And then some an announcer started called me that kind of as a joke one time. And then... I kind of went back, and when I won, I did the like the flex, macho man flex that everyone expects now, and and then it just kind of stuck. So I've had other nicknames throughout my career, but that one's the one that stuck. And now it just the kid kids like it. They you know they say the macho man, and um, it just works. Sometimes that's the that's how things uh, go. Super you, cool. I've often wondered. You well, know, I, just, I didn't know, but can, so obviously you need to do the impression now. Uh, I, <laughs> I mean, I, we're here. You, you need to do it because I haven't seen, I have to well, see how good the, it is. The impression <laughs> takes some fuel from, okay. Fair from yeah. a win. Yeah. Well, the, it takes some liquid courage. Right. To do right. I don't know. I saw you get out after, uh, after the BC 39 and, and you did a pretty good one. Yeah. Well, the, the flex I can, I do when I win, but the impression, that's a whole nother. Oh. Thing. Gotcha. But I think there's some videos floating around on YouTube. You can check it out. I've done some other impressions, Ward Burton and some other ones throughout the years. A long time ago. I haven't done any in you know, quite some time. It's funny. I was looking through YouTube, and there was a video of a, a young boy, maybe six years old, maybe seven years old, that interviewed you. Do you find, as you get older, that you become an idol to some of these young kids that they look up to you. It just, I thought it was so interesting that he, the, he was asking you questions and he was just so enamored with you as, as a driver, but being a youngster and taking that type of interest, I thought was kind of neat. Yeah. I mean, I remember being that kid, you know, and going and looking at Steve Kinzer's car and, you know, he was my, you know, he was, it was either Steve or Sammy and I was a Steve, a Steve Kinzer fan. So I remember being that guy, and I remember when they would roll into town, wow, the trucks and the trailers, and it, it was so big when the outlaws came to town. And I, uh, that's kind of my, when I was growing up, I wanted to race wing sprint cars because that's all we had in Oklahoma. Um, and then it just happened to, that the midget stuff started coming, and we did that and found success non-wing, which we've had a lot of success wing as well, but um, that wasn't really on the radar growing up. But, but now seeing people, you know, kids paint their car like my car you know that's uh that's pretty cool and try to obviously take care of the kids as much as we can we try to go sign autographs and stuff during the races and have them meet you face to face but uh, yeah i think the the name the macho man kids can grab onto Gravitate that to and it, yeah. brady bacon no kid ever calls me brady it's brady bacon yeah. they like they they say the whole name for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, it rolls off the tongue. It, it, it actually yeah. really does. It's 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 a great name for sure. Uh, so three championships: 2014, 16, and reigning champ 2020, coming out of that crazy uh, pandemic year, and currently leading in USAC National Sprint Car points as well. The question is: 2014 to 2020. Talk to me about the difference of winning the championship. You win the first one, and then you win the third one. Is it? Uh, is it not as shiny when you win the third one? Uh, the third one's probably the most special to me so far because the first two, Hoffman's took care of all the equipment and everything at their shop in Cincinnati, and I just basically showed up uh, like a helmet bag racer and and raced. Obviously, I had some input in you know our program and what cars we had and you know setups and stuff. Worked with Rob Hoffman on that, but the third one, um, we take care of all the cars at my shop now, so the team I run the team and everything. So. A little more pride goes into it, and uh, obviously still have a great relationship with Hoffman's, and it's kind of cooperative effort, but uh, probably a little sweeter when it, you know, I had a little more to do with the success. What is the, the operation? It, you're, you have a shop in Ohio, correct? Union City, Ohio. It's, a, it's like a couple blocks into Ohio. Okay. I live in Winchester, Indiana, 
And then uh, about 15 minutes from there is... Uh, you were excited about the started. Silver Crown race. Did you go to it? I promoted that race. Oh, you yeah. promoted it. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. did read somewhere where you were promoting races where, or where it said, hopefully we'll get a chance to promote a couple of races. I'm like, am I reading that right? So you're a promoter. Yeah, we do a midget race, the T-Town Midget Showdown at Port City in the, the springtime. And this was our second year for that. And uh, I think the winner this year wound up with, uh, I think, like $8,500. So big for a midget race. And then uh, we did our first race there at Winchester this year, the Rich Vogler Classic. And uh, everyone seemed to have a really good time. Our original date got rained out, and we rescheduled the, kind of the beginning of Sprint Week. And it worked out really well. So we'll kind of talk to USAC and stuff. And I think that'll probably be, if we do it again, that'll kind of be the date we shoot for. But it's a, it's a different... Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into a, uh, promoting an event to do it the way that we want to do it. So. Toughest part about it is what? Uh, just organizing everything. Um, the dirt on a dirt track, I'm really hard on myself. I want the track to be as good as possible this year. I think we kind of missed it and the, the race wasn't as good, but the first year we had it, the race was like unbelievable, like four wide for the lead on an eighth mile track. So kind of set the bar a little high and anytime that, it's not perfect. I am a little disappointed, but pavement, you don't have to worry about that. So that was a little <laughs> bit easier not to have to worry about preparing the track and stuff like that. So um, Shane Stewart actually owns the track we do it uh, in Oklahoma, Port City. He just bought it this year. So he was learning the track too. And so it was a little uh, kind of learning on both of our parts, but he's had all year and he's been working really hard. I, I talked to him often just kind of see how things are going so i think next year we'll hopefully hit it perfect again are you do you follow all forms of motorsports do you not follow motorsports outside of what you do what what do you watch when you have some spare time what little you probably have um i uh you know we keep up with sprint cars obviously uh the, the outlaws all stars and um if we're you know off and they're racing somewhere usually watch it or have it on my phone at least kind of to um just keep an eye on what's going on i'm not going to watch every heat race and qualifying and all that but uh i and i enjoy watching nascar now that kyle's back and in a in a good car and bell and stenhouse has been running good that adds a lot when honestly when kyle was out i didn't watch it so and now that they're you know a, kind of a new crop of people coming up it's interesting to see and um it's amazing how one driver can affect our brains to watch a series like that. I was the same way with Dale, uh, Dale Sr. When, when Dale died, I probably didn't watch for a couple of years. I mean, he was just my guy. He was my favorite guy at the time, like so many people. And then started, started kind of rooting for Stewart. And Stewart did some crazy stuff, too. From time to time, I'd be like, man, are you, are you kidding me, you know? But, but just one person that you really have this affection for that you want to see do well will draw you to watch that race. It only takes one. And like you said, I mean, where I think we're all involved now with, with Kyle and Bell and, and Stenhouse, some of the short track guys that have made their way up in there. And no, we like want to uh, see how Chase Elliott's you know? running midgets. It's going to be at the BC 39. Yeah. And I'll, I'll also another thing that contributes to it, the, the broadcast content quality has gone up immensely. Yeah. <laughs> it's not as kind of cheesy as it used to be. They actually have informative people. I loved um, – Jeff Gordon and uh, Clint Boyer working together, and uh, then Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Jeff Burton have a lot of knowledge. It's a lot better as far as someone who's a little more uh, in the know. They they kind of touch on the some of the details that some people might not understand, but they also cover it simply for, for people that kind of just need the introductory stuff. But I think that helps a lot. I think that's come a long way in the last three or four years. Agreed. Do you like stage racing? Is that something that, that appeals to you as, as far as coming from your background when NASCAR went to that format? Do you like, like those stages? Yeah, you know, I like it. It does make it, you know, more exciting. And those points matter, you know, at the, and you can tell that it matters. So it does, I think it adds a little bit. Um, I think that NASCAR had to make some changes and, uh, you know, our form of racing, short track racing is probably growing in popularity when theirs was kind of faltering and i think they kind of took some you know you gotta look at other people's playbooks sometimes and if yours isn't working you gotta make some changes so i think it it chops it up i think the shorter race weekends obviously the teams love it maybe if they don't get to practice and they're not good they don't like it but it it's we don't need to be there for four they don't need to be there for four days and have a happy hour and a practice and um i think 
condensing it down makes it a little more feasible. I liked last year when they did races on Tuesday night or Wednesday night. I like that. Um, so it's interesting to see kind of how things are changing and obviously getting to talk. I talked to Kyle some and seeing his thoughts on some things and, um, he probably thinks about it a lot less than some. He just gets in and drives. So he's, that's kind of his style. He's so, such a natural, my God. Yeah. You know I mean? But, uh, yeah, I think it's, I think the racing's been a little more entertaining than it has been in the past. So, uh, that's what I watch. But obviously, sprint cars, I'm person, have personal relationships and friendships with people and you keep, keep track of that. But other forms, like, I really, unless it's the Indi- Indianapolis 500, I hate to say it, I don't really keep, I'm not very good at keeping up with, uh, um, well, you're so busy with the racing. Yeah, you know, we're. I mean, we race year, almost. It's not like you're playing year. golf, you know. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you know, usually when they're racing, we are either racing or on right. the road, so it's hard to, a little harder to keep up with it. Let's pause for a moment here to take a quick break. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Dream Giveaway. Dream Giveaway has been giving away high-end American muscle cars to raise money for charity since 2007. Dream Giveaway is known for giving away classic and new muscle and paying the federal taxes so the winners don't have to. For $25, you can jump in the game, and part of that goes to charity. You'll have a chance at winning some of the coolest cars on the planet. Check it out at dreamgiveaway.com. You've won so many big races. I mean, really not, as, as Michael said in the beginning of the show, really not much you haven't accomplished inside of a sprint car. Uh, how important, is there one race that, that you really would like to add to the list? Silver Crown, Midget, the Sprint Chili Park. Bowl. I knew that's where I was yeah, going. Yeah, I'm from, I, you know, I'm <laughs> and so from close Air, in 2019, Oklahoma. I mean, you had, you know, you had a great opportunity. Yeah, and I'm from... Right down the road. I've yeah, been Broken Arrow since for I was sure. A kid, so yeah. that one's important. Obviously, it, uh, I wish it paid a little bit better, but uh, as sentimentally, that's probably one that I'd well, really... they could pay nothing. You, the, you, you could pay them, and they think they'd get the same crowd. The, yeah, yeah. The lure of that one. I really need to win a USAC sprint car race at Kokomo, too. I've, I've finished second seven times in USAC sprint cars at Kokomo, so that one seems to be a little monkey on my back, just kind of bothering me. I need to win there. When you see Kyle Larson, who spends most of his time obviously running running cup, and then show up in a sprint car or a midget and accomplish what he accomplishes, I mean, speaking of the Chili Bowl, you know, does it make you scratch your head a little bit? Uh, I mean, I've seen him. I remember there's a picture when he took a picture with me at the Chili Bowl when I was like 16 and he was like 12 or 13. But I've watched him and raced with him through his whole career, and he's just got a natural ability to do it. So it doesn't really surprise me any more stuff that he's able to do. Did you know it right away when you raced against him that, wow, this kid's something special? Yeah. Really? For quite some time, yeah. Even, you know, obviously he wasn't as good when he was 15, 16. Now he's getting better and better all the time, so even more dangerous. So I'm, just glad he, <laughs> I'm just glad he got back in cups so we don't have to deal with Go him. Go away, man. Time. Just... <laughs> Uh, you know, talk to me about 2021, um, the Chili Bowl there too, because it was a kind of a special situation. You hooked back up with Kelly Hink, yep. and uh, and that relationship goes much deeper. I think 2016, maybe you were with him, but um, but that that relationship goes way back. Yeah, my dad raced with the Hink family like in the late 80s, early 90s, and uh, in micros and stuff, and they're. Uh, pretty influential in the micro racing at sweet springs they have a really nice micro track there that i grew up racing at um and then i was just running the shootout i had called sawyer chassis to say i kind of want to run this year i don't remember what year it was it was several years ago and uh so they hooked me up with kelly to to drive the car i think i actually slid somebody out of the seat um at the time and then we won the shootout which is an important race to me uh oh yeah four drillers right don't you yeah yeah from the shootout so uh, always kind of a, a cool race that i like to go do and then ever since then we just kind of would race here and there and just kind of have one car that was mine that i liked that, that kind of just sits there ready whenever you know and then in 2020 when there was no racing going on there were some micro races in oklahoma at the track that we were promoting at and he's like yeah take it down there race it and then uh, he kind of he had a midget and we raced it some and he kind of wanted to invest a little bit more in that program and so we kind of took it in our shop and i built one a triple x midget kind of the way i wanted to do it uh, because i hadn't i hadn't really got to do that in quite some time in midget racing i kind of bounced around and it's hard to really get 
a rhythm going and a lot of success. So we've ran a handful of times. We were really good at the Chili Bowl um, and uh, had a good run there and then uh, until I crashed. But uh, uh, and then we've ran really good with USEC this year and had a motor problem in, in midget week. But we got that all freshened up and we're ready for the BC 39. I don't know what the accident rate is in what you do. Obviously, there you've got guys sliding. But last time you raced in Terre Haute, we have a photo of you flipping and you did a barrel roll. I think you went over twice. And the air you got before you went up and out of the track, what in the world? And we have it on our video monitor, and we thank Chad Warner for that photo. What in the world is going through your mind when you're up that high in the air? Uh, close your eyes, for one, because if you don't, I still got like a bloodshot eye. One of my eyes went all red. But uh, if you don't close your eyes, they'll both be really red and can actually cause damage because of the G-forces when you flip. So right. like, always close your eyes and then just... Hang on, you know. Uh, Does it go silent? What? I, yeah, it's pretty silent when you're up in the air. Yeah. That's unbelievable yeah, to me. But you're really not thinking. It's just kind of. Do you tense up and hang on? Yeah, you, you, just, ten, I, I would assume, you don't yeah. really think about what you're doing. Right. But yeah, tense up and sometimes you'll bend your steering wheel. or so. I usually let go because I grew up racing micros and they're manual steering. Right. So if you hit something, it'll. Break fingers or yeah, wrist or your yeah. thumb. So, so I, and then after that, you come back and finish third. Yeah, yeah. That one. I mean, I've crashed much less spectacularly, and it hurt a lot worse. So, uh, got pretty fortunate that when it landed, it landed on the tail tank, and then kind of kept going and absorbed some of the the impact. But uh, yeah, we were a little sore for a couple of days after that, but uh, wasn't terrible. I was very fortunate. A lot of good safety equipment that. Kept me uh, pretty much contained in there. Tough on the wives to watch a moment like that. Yeah, I'm sure it was. My parents were there uh, and some family friends, so uh, that was probably tougher for them. But, uh, I mean, I knew I landed and I was fine. Actually, my steering, the shaft broke, and I couldn't get the steering wheel off. We had to actually unbolt the steering wheel. So that was probably the scariest part if there would have been a fire or something. You couldn't get out, yeah. I probably could have got out, but it would have been... I would have had to have been mo- a good squeezing, bit yeah, 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 squeezing out. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I already knew my guys would be getting the backup car down, and uh, when I got back, they already had it <laughs> pretty much. I'm sitting there, I can't get out of the car. Steering chest yeah. broken. I'm thinking, I bet the guys are getting the, the spare car down. <laughs> yeah, it took. A, we were like laying on the chain link fence down there, so it took a little bit to get the car picked up and and all that. But uh, yeah, I was fortunate, and uh, now we have a t-shirt. Sell a lot of t-shirts with that there picture you, boom, on boom. it. Boom. There, so there you go. Try to make uh, lemonade out of the lemon there sometimes. You, you mentioned your father, um, and I, I mentioned at the top of the show, third generation driver, your grandfather Ted and your father Leon, both uh, active racers, and your father very successful at the time. Is he still still active? No, I think the last time he raced was probably 2009. Yeah. yeah. and I Active with your team at all? Um, not, No, not really. Uh, he comes, he kind of he likes to enjoy his time at the races yeah, now good for instead him. of working. But I had the, a really good opportunity, I think it was in 2010, um, that he got to come on the road with me for about six months. So that was uh, really awesome to be able to race full-time with my dad there. Um, obviously, growing up, we raced with each other and against each other. Um, but, uh, you know, race sprint cars at a high level, ASCS National with my dad there helped expedite the learning process did he enjoy getting back out on the road with you not i I would imagine being with you but does did he miss the being on the road aspect of the racing well he had that at that time 2009 he was or 2010 he was kind of pretty regularly on the road still kind of going to a lot of races and that schedule is closer to oklahoma oklahoma kansas texas so they he could come a lot more but now it's a little, he just kind of comes and he kind of knows everything's taken care of and he just enjoys the sense watching. of accomplishment for a father. And, and, and I, I know this from experience is I was able to help my son get up to a certain level and then other people started getting involved and he, he advanced a little bit more, but I was still active in, in it. And now whenever we go, I have, aside from spotting for him, I have absolutely nothing to do with the car or running the team. He's with people that, you know, are, are much better than I will, will ever be. And just having that sense of confidence, knowing that he's good at what he does and he's with a really good team, you know, to sit back, as you said, your father just wants to enjoy. But I promise you his sense of accomplishment as he sits back knowing, like, my son's a straight-up badass. He's a great driver, does a great job with his team, 
everything's sorted. I mean, I, I promise you, he's he's enjoying it as much as any time that he raced. Yeah, and, and you know, so there are some times when I, uh, especially like midgets and micros, if I'm racing those, that I'll be like, yeah, it's kind of doing this. What do you think? And uh, so that it's kind of nice to have someone that. Yeah, the vision is still of. there, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure he still sees everything. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, and le- he doesn't really say much unless I I ask for something, and sometimes he'll just say, "I don't know, I don't worry about that anymore." <laughs> but, Some, uh, sometimes I, I approach it in a way different manner now. If I see something that I think is off or odd, I'll go to him and say, "So when you were going through this turn, what what was going on there?" I won't say. It looked to me like you were making a mistake. Right. I, I don't go that far, you know. I was like, something just looked off there, and then he'll know exactly what I'm talking about nine times out of ten, and and we'll we'll discuss it. But yeah, it's pretty cool that you had that relationship coming coming through. Were you ever part of it when your grandfather was racing? No, I never saw my grandfather race, and and then he comes uh, to a lot of races too, and oh, uh, awesome. I have people all the time. Is your grandpa coming? How's your grandpa doing? So. That's kind of cool racing community. He meets all kinds of you meet all kinds of people, and um, it's just uh, great to be involved with something like that. Super, super cool. Well, we uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. We know you're busy. In fact, going to race at the action track tonight, correct? Yeah, first time back since the uh, famous picture that you showed there. So <laughs> back to the scene you of the crime. You created it. Oh, before you take off, or before we close this show, we want to thank Mark Allen. Uh, Mark Allen Artworks uh, did a did some beautiful drawing over there of, of the car for you uh that we have here in the studio and yeah popped up on the video screen yeah, there nice as well painting. matter of fact there's a look at uh, at mark so we appreciate um that artistic view of you and your race car pretty cool stuff yeah he does a really good job he's done some stuff for me over the past few years and uh really awesome stuff kind of a unique not a lot of uh, content like that for racing stuff so it's awesome to get something special like that it really is safely inside of the top 10 winningest all time in USAC and sprint cars congratulations on that as you chase uh, your fourth championship we wish you the best of luck can't thank you enough for coming in here and spending some time with us man yeah thanks for having me glad Rico wasn't here to dig up any <laughs> scary stories <laughs> fair enough thank you Brady <laughs> ladies and gentlemen Brady Bacon the macho man you're watching the skinny Thanks for being with us here on The Skinny. This episode has been brought to you by Toyota, Rhino Classifies, Dream Giveaway, and General Tire. For the latest in sunglasses, optical frames, accessories, and apparel, be sure to check out fatheads.com. That's fatheads with a Z. Production facilities provided by Fatheads Eyewear Studios. All rights reserved.